Aren't these girls wonderful? Boy, I just, they can really make you feel like you're worshiping and everything along that line. Oh, by the way, if you want to, you can do fill out the question and answer sheet that's in your bulletin. And, uh, you know, I don't preach very often, and so I decided to try to get a little confidence and encouragement from Carol, uh, my wife. And uh, I said, you know, this week uh, you're going to listen to me. And she says, well, I've heard your sermons for 50 years. I suppose I could stand to listen to another one. So I humbly come before you today and I want to preach to you about a subject that's dear to my heart and that is uh, be ready for Christ's return and our scripture text is going to be Matthew 24 uh, 1 through 51 and uh, I always like to include a key verse and uh, this is the one I'd like for you to remember if, uh, if all else fails I'd like for you to remember that. And it's therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. As we take a look at the um, second coming of the Lord, there are two messages uh, that we see that uh, that gives us. Uh, and the first message is a warning. Have you ever noticed people do not listen to warnings? It just seems like it's human nature. The sign, wet paint. What do we do? Oh, it was wet. My finger is blue. Well, I have to take care of that. You know, there's also a story that came about a a man who was driving his mother. This is the speed limit sign. You know, and he was driving his mother one Sunday afternoon, and she kept scolding him for going over the speed limit, and unfortunately, he dismissed her. And guess what? A trooper went ahead and pulled him over and gave him a ticket. As they resumed their journey, he kept saying, I should have got a warning. I should have got a warning. I should have got a warning. And his mother said, I gave you the warning, and the trooper gave you the ticket. Now, our children are not innocent in all of this. They, too, have a way of trying to get around warnings. And this happened in a church or a church school. It was lunchtime, and uh, they were going through a luncheon buffet, and they came to the apples, and there was a sign there. And the sign said, uh, basically, apples, take one per person. Remember, God is watching you. Well, you go further down the line, and I know this was a child scribbled in a crayon on another side by the cookies that said, take all the cookies you want, because God's watching the apples. <laughs> you know, we're just like that today, but when we come to the second coming, we realize that these warnings are very stern and very important. Uh, and it's a warning for all believers uh, it is a warning for sinners who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It is a warning to all those that have been so preoccupied with the world, have chosen to ignore God, His Word, and His will, and don't think they have anything to worry about. This will be a day of eternal judgment. They have been warned. So the first message that we get in the second coming is there's a warning. But there's a second message. And I like it because it's to the Christians, and it's a promise. And I think we all look forward to the time when Jesus Christ will come again, and we shall be lifted up, and we shall spend all eternity in heaven. What a wonderful day that will be. We shall go to heaven and have eternal bliss. We shall see Jesus, and we shall be with Jesus. What a glorious, glorious day that will be. And we will experience all of the wonders of heaven. Now, when we go to the next slide, which is in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> and uh, there we see John as he has experienced uh, uh, the, the, the heavenly experience. Uh, and John is recording what he heard. And he said, I heard in a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He 
will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. When we take a look, uh, we realize that uh, our setting of our text uh, uh, comes from Jesus and his disciples in the 24th chapter of Matthew. And the disciples were very, very impressed with the temple and all the buildings that were there in Jerusalem. And Jesus tells them that the buildings and the temple all were going to be destroyed. And the disciples were really astonished. And uh, they asked Jesus two questions. The first question is, when will this happen? And the second question, what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? So Jesus begins this discourse in the 24th uh, chapter of Matthew uh, of his coming so that his disciples would be ready. Now, uh, the next quote that I noticed from a scholar who's written many books from Warren Wiersbe, and I think what he said was very, very pointed and, and something that we should embrace. He said Jesus did not want his disciples to get so involved in the prophecies of the future that they would neglect the responsibilities of the present. And you know, I think that that's good advice for us. I've known people that got so involved in the prophecies, we cannot neglect the responsibilities of the present, which is to tell people of Jesus Christ. This is and was true of Jesus' disciples. It is true for us. This is a very, very difficult passage of Scripture to understand. And we're not going to get into all of the shades of the meanings because we have a greater purpose in mind. We need to realize that there's one thing that we need to understand in the certain is that Jesus Christ is coming again. And since this is true, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared mentally. We need to be pre prepared spiritually. And also, we need to be ready, and those that we love need to be ready as well. So we must not neglect the present responsibilities. Now, one of the things that we see here today is that Jesus uh, answers three questions about the coming of the Lord and his return, which will give us some insight and help us to understand what is about to happen. So the first one is, he says, how will Jesus return? In verse 3, the disciples were asked Jesus if you give them a sign. Verse 30 answers some very, very important questions. So we're going to read this lengthy passage, and uh, we especially will be looking at verse 30. So if anyone tells you uh, he is, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there will the vultures gather. I told you this would be hard to understand. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then we go and it says, at this time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. And get this, and I want you to see this, with power and great glory. So Jesus first came as a sacrificial lamb. And he was one who died on the cross for our sins. But when he comes the second time, he comes as a lion. He is coming as the king of kings. And he is coming as the Lord of lords. And he will appear in the sky. His power and authority will be seen everyone and by all. The righteous will stand in awe and the wicked will have their mourning. At this time, Christ will now come to assert his power he will come to assert his authority yes Jesus will come with great power and authority 
Now, when we take a look and we get glimpses of what heaven is like, and we can see what glory is going to be, and we see that he is not only going to come with power and authority, but with great glory. Now, we take a look at the word glory. It means the visible display of honor and majesty. This glory <clears throat> will be manifested in a manner by the coming of Jesus, the ripping apart of the heavens, surrounded by the angels and all the wonders that surround him in the sky. The presence of the Lord will be an awesome sight. There isn't going to be anybody calling the man, God the man upstairs. Knees will bow. Tons will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His holy presence will bring awe and reverence unto his names. And for us who are Christians, we will rejoice. Because we have prepared for his coming. But you know, there are no's that haven't. And even though they've been warned, they will say, if only I had known. They, they are the ones who were so busy with the things of the world that they did not think about Christ's return. <clears throat> I'd like to tell you a story about this word, if only I had known. And I saw this once, either on a video or television. It's been a while ago. It involved two high school girls and the charcoal grill. You know that grill is right here. See it? It's imaginary. It's right here. Had one girl standing here, another girl standing there. Now, we all know that you put the charcoal lighter on first, and then you put in the match. But some of us guys, you know, we don't think it's doing too well. So how many of you guys have decided we need a little extra, you know, so we stand back and we squirt and, whew, you know, we see the fire. But we've all been told you never, never, ever mix gasoline with fire because there'll be an explosion. And the one girl saw that she thought it needed a little help and she had a gasoline can. So <clears throat> her idea was to put a little on there and, she, and before, before any gasoline came out of the tank, the vapors went inside of the can, can and blew out like a blower torch to the girl that was sitting over here. And her face became unrecognizable. I'll bet those girls, through the warnings, we all know gasoline and fire don't mess. I imagine they had said time and time again, if only I had known. If only I had known. It was the same during Noah's day. Ominous clouds flashes of lightning, pouring down rain, flooding occurred. Many probably headed to the ark, but at this time it was too late. The door was shut. And as the water was coming to their necks and maybe their last words might have been, if only I had known. This is something that I think is very important that I want to say. We shouldn't be so busy that we're not ready for Christ's return. And I kind of thought I would mention this because I have struggled with this a little bit. And I, and I think probably you have too. And I wanted to share this. There's an awful, and I don't want to get political, but there's an awful lot going on in the political sphere. Would you agree? It's a distraction. It wants to grab hold of you. It wants to make you angry. It wants to make you not looking that Jesus is going to come again. And it's a distraction that Satan is using and using with a lot of people. And there's anger that's going everywhere. Don't get caught up in the anger. Don't get caught up in that. We as Christians, we need to pray and we need to ask that God would lead and guide our... But remember... We should not be so busy with the things of this world that we are not ready. We should live each day of our lives knowing that he, Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Okay, now we said that Jesus was answering three questions. And so uh, now we see with the second one, well, why will Christ return? Why will Jesus return? And um, 
So we go to the next slide and there is two reasons. Oh, I guess not. Uh, first of all, we're going to uh, gather his elect and that is fellowship. Gathering the elect and that is we as Christians are fellowship. Christ is specific reason and purpose for his coming again. The first part is to gather the elect and have fellowship with them to reward them. Now this verse says, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from all, from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Elect means Christians, those Christians, or it can be the chosen of God. And with that word, and I know that I've probably overdone that in my Bible class on Sunday morning, but when Jesus chose the disciples, he chose John, he chose Peter, and they chose him. Therefore, they were what? The chosen. God does not want anyone to perish. He has chosen you. He has given you an avenue that Jesus died on the cross. And when we choose him, we become what? One of the chosen. And so God chosen ones will have chosen him. When the verse says the Christians will be gathered from all parts of the earth with the help of the angels. Before Adam and Eve, during the time of Adam and Eve, God had a special relationship with them. That was before their sin in the garden. And throughout scripture, we have seen that God loves us. And their sin separated them from God. And sin also does that for us. But we see so much love in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And all of this is done so we could be reunited in this wonderful fellowship with God. And uh, we'll be in heaven. It'll be glorious. It'll be wonderful. A great family reunion. And one of the wonderful things is it will last forever. It is the promise that Christ has given us. If we have accepted him. It is that true. Now we go to the second one, and he has said that a reason he's going to come, he's going to make all things right, and he is to judge the wicked, and there will be a separation. <clears throat> and uh, when we get to verse 30, again, that we just read, it says, all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will have reason to mourn. They have despised, and they have rejected the Lord they rejected his power, they rejected his authority, they rejected his word, and for them will be final judgment. Now, we take a look at some of the parables that uh, he gave, parables of the tares, the fishnet, the angels will separate the wicked from the righteous, the wicked will not inherit their glorious home in heaven, they will be condemned, punished, and separated from God forever. When we take a look it's an interesting thing. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, we see that the, the, uh, Jesus has come, and those on his right side are the righteous ones, and those on his left are the ones that have been considered not righteous. And Jesus goes through this. When I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. When I was a prisoner. And uh, to the wicked, he was, they say, well, when did we see this? When you've done it to one of the least of me, my brothers, you've done it to me. And he will say the same thing to them. And then this is what's going to happen. They will go and be separated forever. And as we are lifted up, they will be left behind. Forever and ever and ever. And we as Christians will have this wonderful, wonderful experience about going to heaven and being there. But, you know, I didn't write the Bible, right? God did. Sometimes I would rather talk about the love of God and heaven rather than hell. But the scripture warns us again and again. And we see that all the nations of earth will mourn. And... Some people believe, you know, it's okay because I'm almost saved. And there's a hymn, we all know it, and I want to share it with you, <clears throat> Almost Persuaded. 
And the hymn writer says, almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul will say, go spirit, go thy way. Come more convenient day, on thee I call. The next verse, almost persuaded, come, come today. Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Angels are lingering near. Prayers rise from hearts so dear. O wanderer, come. The last verse that I'm going to read says, Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail. Almost but lost. There's no such thing as almost being saved. Now, the third, we go to something more positive, and we come to the third question, when will he return? And when we take a look at this, we see that he is going to return suddenly and unexpectedly. Jesus uh, closes this section of scripture with three practical admonitions, the illustration of the fig tree, the illustration of Noah, and the illustration of the thief in the night. So in Matthew 24, uh, 36, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels um, in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. You know, the illustration of the fig tree says that the blossoms will come, and when the blossoms have come, it's coming near that the fruit will be there. And so there will be some signs or things that will lead us to the fact that, hey, you know, Jesus is coming soon. Then there's Noah, who that kind of tells us that people were uh, eating and drinking and marrying. They had no thought. They were unprepared. They didn't know that judgment is coming. And then the same thing with the burglar. We are told that we will not know the hour or the time when Christ will come. Each of these illustrations of Jesus' parables shows us that Christ is coming suddenly and unexpectedly. Many will not be ready for the Master and the Lord to come. Many will be too busy with the things of this world. They will be unprepared to meet their Lord. It's just a dangerous thing to get so absorbed in the peace pursuits that we forget of Christ's coming. And then we see that not only is he coming suddenly, and unexpectedly, he's coming soon. Now that's a relative term. For we know it's been 2,000 years since Christ was on the earth. So we see in uh, Matthew 24, 42 and 44, therefore keep watch because you do not know what day your Lord will come. <clears throat> so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. The, the Bible teaches us that we're living in the last days. And each of us has been taught by the Bible that we should believe that Christ is coming in our lifetime. This is what Paul did. He believed Christ was coming. This is what the Lord wants us to believe. The way, and uh, he wants us to be a prepared people expecting him at any moment. Still, some say the Lord has been gone. A long, long time. Isn't that right? So why should I expect? That was the problem with Israel. They walked through the water, the cloud by, you know, and, and the fire and, and everything, and they forgot about that. Well, God was with us a long, long time ago. You know, maybe time is relative, and uh, maybe it hasn't been that long. Uh, in 1992, Bob Russell wrote a book entitled, When Life is a Zoo, God Still Loves You. Now, this was in 1992. He writes, do you know how many a billion is? A billion seconds ago, John F. Kennedy was inaugurated. A billion minutes ago, Jesus walked on the face of the earth. A billion hours ago, Man did not exist. But a billion dollars ago was yesterday noon at Washington, D.C. Maybe it hasn't been that long. And in 1 Peter 3.8, it says to the Lord, a day is a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Jesus is coming 
Maybe it hasn't been all that long. So to conclude today, <clears throat> there are two things, a fact and a question. Christ is coming again. And the question I propose to you is, are you ready? It's emphatic, he is coming again. And there will be those that are ready and those that are not. <clears throat> In this particular church, for years and years and years, we have an invitation hymn. And uh, a person can accept Jesus Christ as their personal, give their desire, repent of their sin, be baptized in the water and grass of baptism to rise in newness of life. Uh, <clears throat> some who are Christians who have been immersed into Christ would like to become a member and, and join with us as a spiritual family. Um, some are just having a hard time. And Pastor Eric has always said, if, if you need to rededicate or if, if you're having, if you're struggling, you know, we will pray for you. And, and the elders will come up and, and we will do that. I've always looked at the invitation is it's for all of us. Maybe God is knocking on our door. Maybe he's trying to share something with us. Maybe he's trying to get us to do something. Or maybe there are certain maybe sins that are clinging to us like leprosy and we just need to get rid of them. So whatever your decision is, I hope that you'll make one because Christ is coming again. Let's all stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Yeah.